Welcome to our Midweek Fellowship. Get ready for a time of worship and a powerful word brought during our Sunday in-person service. We believe God has a now word for you today. Verses 21 through 25, it says this. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. 
For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So James is reminding us that we have to be intentional to not just listen, but to really hear the word. How many know it's so easy to have something come in one ear and out the other? You leave and you say, what did they talk about? I don't remember. I mean, I've been guilty of that before where I don't know if this has happened to you, but I'll tell on myself. I've had to really train myself to become a better listener. Because I can have somebody talking to me, and I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, oh, mm mm-hmm. But on the inside, I'm totally somewhere else. And then they ask me a question, and I'm like, ooh, oh, nuts, I wasn't listening. See, we all have tendencies as humans to listen, but not to really listen, right? And the same is true with the Word of God. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you've read the word of God and then you said, okay, good. I read my Bible for today. And then you go and you get your coffee and you get about your day. And then you're like, what did I read? I've, I'm just going to be honest. There's been times I've been reading the book of Psalms. Let's say I'm just going to pick that example. And I read it. And I'm like, this is really good. And I'm getting into it. And the next thing I know, I'm thinking about the appointment I have later on in the afternoon. I'm still reading. My eyes are still going down the page. And then I'm thinking about what I got to do. And then I was thinking about this situation. And then I was like, this happened to me the other day. And I was like, I have no idea. My eyes glanced over four verses, but it didn't get in. Anybody can relate to me? <laughs> like, I think James points this out because he understands human nature. We have a tendency to listen, but not to really hear. To read, but not absorb. And so when it comes to the word of God, James is telling us it's not enough just to sit in church and hear. You've got to really take in what God is saying. And the way that you show that you're absorbing the word of God, that you're taking it in, is because it's changing the way you think and act and speak. And that's what it is when he says you have to not just hear it, but you got to do it. And I want to bring your attention to the beginning of this passage because it says that we must humbly accept the word of God that has been planted in our hearts. Why? It has the power to save your soul. Now, I want to point out that this is one of those dual layer meanings. Save your soul in terms of salvation, but also in terms of sanctification. That's a big churchy word. But let me just break it down to you. Sanctification means the process of changing where you're becoming like Jesus Christ. So the word of God has the power to save you for salvation, but the word of God has also the power to change us so that little by little we're becoming more like Jesus Christ. But the only way it can do that is if we will receive it, act upon it. Not just listen, but obey. So we have to humbly accept What does that mean? That means that sometimes the word of God isn't easy to digest. Sometimes you'll read some things in scripture and it's like, "Mm, that's a little hard to deal with today. But we humbly accept the power of the word of God so that we can become more like Jesus. And this scripture tells us that it's not enough just to listen. We must act upon what we hear. Look at your neighbor and say, listen and obey. Listen and obey. Look what it says. It says, if you listen to the word and don't obey, you're just fooling yourself. You're living in deception. I like what Joyce Meyer says. Just because you sit in a garage doesn't make you a car. And just because you sit in church doesn't make you a Christian. (laughs) It's not enough just to come to church, to go through the motions, It's not enough to put on podcast. I don't know. I've been guilty. I said, Lord, I need some extra word. Put on the podcast, and then I'm not even listening to the podcast. You know, you put on the live stream in the morning, and then you go and clean your house. Next thing you know, the live stream's over, and you didn't even really pay attention. We're all guilty of it. Let's just be honest. 
And so there is a calling that in order for us to continue to go from the next level of faith in Christ to grow in maturity, we have to not just hear the word, but we got to act upon the word. Satan used scripture when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. So it's not just enough to hear scripture or even to know scripture. It's got the power to save your soul, to sanctify you. You know you're getting it when the word of God is changing you. That's when you know that it has come in to affect your life. We have to listen and obey. Faith and action, obedience. When we choose to believe and act on God's word, then the power of God's word is released. Because look what it says. It says that the word of God that's planted, it has what? It has power. The word of God has power. But the only way that power gets released is if we don't just listen, but we act on it. For instance, we talk about tithing. When the only time God says, test me and see. He says, if you'll give me your whole tithe, test me and see if I will not pour out so much abundance, you can't contain it. And I will prevent the devourer. Well, if you're not willing to act on that, you'll never experience the power of God's word for more abundance and protection from the enemy. A lot of times what keeps you and I from experiencing firsthand the promises of God is that we listen to it and we say, yeah, I want that. But we don't take the next step of acting on it. When you and I hear the word and act on it, then it brings us into a deeper level of knowing who God is, his character, his nature, what he does, because everything God does flows from who he is. And the only way you can know God in his nature is to act upon his word. So we have to choose not just to believe it, but to act upon it. And when we act upon the word of God, the power that the word contains is released in our situations. It's released within ourselves. It's released and affects everything within and without. Amen? See, the kids are excited back there. James talks a lot about the practicality of what real faith looks like when we live it out. We got to be slow to speak and quick to listen. So even here, James is reminding us, hey, slow down, listen. Don't be so quick to talk. Listen. In our prayer life, we need to listen more because God is speaking. He says, hey, watch your anger issues. Get rid of the filth and the evil in your heart, in your life. Learn to control your tongue. Real religion, taking care of orphans and widows. Don't be corrupted or wrongly influenced by the world. Treat everyone as equals. No, no prejudice, no preferential treatment. Make sure you obey the law of love. What is the law of love? Love one another as yourself, right? Obey the commandments. Show mercy instead of judging. Take care of one another and do good deeds. This is just the beginning. The whole book of James goes on into a lot more, but James is like one of those power-packed acai bowls where you get everything you need in one small thing. That's James. He jumps out by saying, hey, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. And then he just gets into it, boom, boom, boom. And he gives us a lot of real life, practical, this is what faith looks like when you live it out. And the only way our faith has power is when we live it out. Look what it says in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. He says this, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Look at this question. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, what does it say? It is dead and useless. Have you ever thought about faith potentially could be dead and useless? 
Our faith, if we don't act on it, is dead and useless. Why? The power of God contains, the word of God, excuse me, the word of God contains power to save us, to change us, to transform us. But it only happens when we submit to the word of God, when we act upon the word of God. If we don't, then we can't tap into the power and our faith is useless. It's dead. I like what the Amplified says in verse 14. What is the benefit? My fellow believers, if someone claims to have faith but has no good works as evidence, can that kind of faith save him? No. A mere claim of faith is not sufficient. Genuine faith produces good works. Read that with me. Genuine faith produces good works. Real faith, genuine faith produces a change in the way we live evidenced by our good works. It's not enough to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Your life must actually reflect that you believe in Jesus. Because if you are living in a way that is opposite to what Jesus modeled for us and what we find in scriptures, then you're fooling yourself. You're living in deception. You might think, I'm good. Me and God are good. I believe in Jesus. I'm good. Scripture says, no, you're not. That kind of faith, the one you don't act on, the kind of faith that doesn't change you, the kind of faith that doesn't impact the way you live, that's not real faith, and it can't save you. You have to act upon what you hear. Our life must reflect what we really believe. And I, let me listen, listen to me. Your life actually does reflect what you believe. I'm not talking about what you say you believe, but what you really believe. The Bible says, for as a man thinks in his heart, that is who he is. So our values, what we really believe, not what we think we believe, not what we wish we believe, but what we really believe, that is the way I live. If I live believing that I, that I got to do everything myself, that it doesn't matter who I step on to get there. It's all about me and my success and my happiness. Every decision I make will reflect that. But if I really believe that God's got me, he's going to provide for me, then I live in a different way. Now it's not about me. It's about God. And it changes your actions. It changes your decisions. It changes your behavior. You guys tracking with me? So the reality is, if you want to know what you believe, like what you really believe, listen to what actually comes out of your mouth. Because the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, you speak. And you want to know what you really believe? When you're stressed out, what comes out of your mouth? <laughs> when you're angry, what comes out of your mouth? That will kind of show us where we're at. How do I act? What do I do? Let's look at what James says in verse 18 through 20. He says, now someone may argue, well, some people have faith. Others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? James just gets right to it. He's like, oh, you say that there's one God and you believe that? Yay, so do the demons. whoop de doo It's not enough to say you believe it. You have to act on it. You have to live according to it. Because if you're not, then you don't actually have genuine faith in Christ. It's faith and works. It's both and. It's not either or. Sometimes some of the challenge in scripture is when we have these truths that on the surface seem like they oppose each other, like they contradict each other, right? And you look at them and you're like, okay, for instance, God is just, which means what? He demands punishment for sin. And God is mercy, merciful, which means I don't treat you according to what you deserve, now, how can God be just? I demand punishment, but then he's merciful. I won't treat you like you deserve. 
because God is the perfect balance of these truths. Human nature tends to be extremes. Robert, if you'll come in and prepare with me. Human nature seems to be that we are creatures of extremes. It's all about justice. You better do the right thing. Laws, do this, don't do this, right? Some people fall into religion and legalism, and I got to do this, and I can't do that, and I got to do this, and don't do that. And we don't even think about mercy and grace. And then there's other people who swing to the other side, and they're all, it doesn't matter how you live. God's grace, he forgives it all. Just go and sin. Do whatever you want. Just make sure you ask forgiveness. We've heard both sides of the coin, haven't we? There are people in religion that think all grace, no consequences. And then we have people over on this side of religion that is like, no grace. You obey the law. You go to hell. Human nature. We're creatures of extremes. But God is the perfect balance of truth. They're complementary truths. God is just. He demands punishment, but God is also merciful. He provided payment for the punishment through Jesus Christ so that all who believe in Jesus Christ are spared from the judgment that his just nature requires so we can drink of his mercy. Do you get it? Both and, not either or. And faith and works are exactly the same way. They work like complementary tension. All right, Robert, I'm going to have you help me some more. So there's a process in helping a young tree to grow called staking. And it's when there are equal but opposite forces that pull in different direction. And that's a bit of what faith and works looks like. We'll have you put that on the string there. Faith on one side. Works on the other side. So, sometimes we want to be extreme. I believe in Jesus. I don't have to act like it, live like it, change the way I live because I believe, so I'm good. All faith, no works. Some people are on this side. I got to do the works because I got to work to make sure I get into heaven. I got to make sure that God likes me. I got to make sure I get some brownie points. I want a bigger mansion, (laughs) right? There's this like different concept. And so it's not about believing in God. It's trying to achieve something for God. And if we get into this, we fall out of balance of what the word of God actually tells us is the right way to look at this. So complementary truths, they might seem contradictory, but when they work together, they provide the opportunity for growth, stability, and maturity. When they stake a tree, it protects it so that the roots can go deeper. It gives the tree time in its infancy to let the roots grow deeper. They work by pulling and holding the tree by stabilizing it. See, I thought it was really interesting because we do tend to be unstable people. (laughs) Right? Depending on how we feel. Depending on what's happening in my life. Oh, God is good. I don't know. You know, I smile at that song. I, I, I'll just be honest. We sang it today. All my life you have been faithful. If you've matured to a point, you can sing that with honesty, even if in your life you've been abused, in your life you've been neglected, in your life you've gone without. Because now you're not focusing on the abuse, you're not focusing on the pain, the trauma, because you can see God's hand working all things through good. But a lot of people look at that lyric and they're like, mm, I don't know, God, because where were you when? Because their faith has not yet had the opportunity to grow. Why? Because you've got to act upon the faith. You've got to act upon the word of God. This is also known as counterbalancing. Those big cranes that move big things, they have to have an equal counterbalance weight because if they don't, it'll tip over. And so we see this throughout the way they grow trees, throughout the way they move heavy equipment and stuff, is that there has to be a balancing. And God is the perfect balance of all truth. We are the ones who need to learn to come into balance. 
We are the ones that if we err on the side of works, we need to learn how to come and balance it with faith. If we tend to err on faith, like, mm, I'm good. I go to church on Sunday. Every now and then I read my Bible. I don't need to do anything else. Then I'm here to tell you, you got to work. It's not enough. If you want to grow and sustain your spiritual life, you have to work. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Tell your friend. It's both and. Both and. So on one side, we have faith. And let me talk about faith. It's really important, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We'll put that up there. You are saved by faith alone. Let's read it together. Read it with me. For by grace you have been saved by faith. Nothing you did could ever earn this salvation. For it was the love gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast. For salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. Wait a minute. Didn't we just say you have to have works? But this says it's not about works. It's about faith. Both and, not either or. So I want to make sure that you understand the truth about faith. You are saved by faith alone. No amount of good works gets you any better with God. He already loves you perfectly. He'll never love you more. He'll never love you less. You are chosen by God. You're accepted by God. He likes you. He delights in you. Whether you ever did something for him or not, that doesn't change how much he loves you. He still sent Jesus to die for you. That will ever, never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever change. And we see that by the criminal who died on the cross right next to Jesus. He didn't do any good works. He was uh, up there for a reason. <laughs> Yet at the last minute, he recognized who Jesus was. He put his faith in Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. So you're saved by faith, not by works. But then we read in James, look at it again, verses, I'm just going to isolate 14 and 17. So what is the benefit, my fellow believers, if someone claims to have faith, but has no good works as evidence? Can that kind of faith save him? No. As we read before, a mere claim of faith is not sufficient. Genuine faith produces good works. So too, if faith if it doesn't have works to back it up, it's by itself dead, inoperative, and ineffective. So this is what you got to understand. If we go all faith and there's no works to back it up, it says it's ineffective, it's useless, it's dead. It leads to spiritual stagnation. And not only will you stagnate, but eventually if you're not careful, you spiritually you will die. You'll spiritually die. So if you're all faith and no works, you're never going to become anything in Christ. You're going to be barren. You're not going to produce fruit. You can't because fruit comes from abiding in Christ and the power of the word of God working in you. So if you're all faith and you don't act on faith with works, then you're going to end up dead. Spiritually dead, barren, fruitless, lifeless. But if you're all works... And you don't understand that your works are motivated by your faith in Christ, then guess what happens? It leads to legalism. I'm trying to earn God's favor. I'm trying to prove that I somehow deserve salvation. You know what it leads to? Burnout. Forget this church stuff. Ugh, doesn't work. Because you're trying to do all works without faith. Faith. Faith comes by hearing the words of Christ. We need faith to be operating at work in our lives and we act upon faith because if not, we'll fall into religion, we'll fall into legalism, and we'll end up dead. So on this side, you end up dead. This side, you end up dead. This side, you end up alive, growing, maturing, fruitful. I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of Christian. Because the Bible says in John 15, if you produce much fruit, it glorifies my Father in heaven. But even Jesus warned, if you don't produce fruit, we're going to cut you off and throw you out. 
So we got to make sure that we don't fall into the extremes, but we learn together. My faith in Christ motivates me to do good works. And I don't do good works to earn anything. I do good works because I believe in Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. So we respond to our faith in God with good works. Does that make sense? It's all about motive. It's about changing why I do what I do for God. So now it's no longer about me and trying to look a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way, which leads to religion, legalism, pride, death. Or it's not just me like, ah, say la vie, what comes, what comes. You know, if God wills it, he'll do it. So I'll just sit here and keep doing what I'm doing and streaming this and doing that and just live my life and That's what it looks like in today's day and age. So I want to talk to you about active faith and passive faith. Because I think that it's really important to understand the difference between the two. All right. So we got to respond to God with faith and we respond in obedience. Good deeds, good works, action validated faith. So let's look at the example James gives us in verse 21 through 22. He says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions work together. Read it. His actions made his faith complete. So what does that mean? Faith without works is incomplete. I'm just going to turn it around. Faith with actions is complete. Faith without any work is incomplete. It's useless. So when I talk about doing good works, it is an outward expression of my inner faith. So what I do on the outside is not to try to earn something, prove something, achieve something. It is a reflection of what I actually believe on the inside and what I've received from God, what he's done in my life. So I don't work to earn salvation. I'm saved by faith. Are you guys tracking with me? Right? So my actions, though, complete my faith. My actions are an expression of my faith. So let's talk about active faith versus passive faith. Here's a great verse, one of my favorites. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, Paul says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when Pastor Jaron was with you. And now that he's away, it's even more important... <laughs> I mean, Paul, Paul was the pastor of the church of Philippi. He's like, when I was with you, you were doing good. Now that I'm gone, keep doing good. You know the saying, when the cat is away, the mice will play. Pastor Jaron, we're being good. Just letting you know. But he says, when I was with you, you were following the instructions. You were doing it. You were walking with Christ. But now that I'm away, don't quit. In other words, you have personal responsibility to continue to do what you're told to do. Not because Pastor Jaron tells you. Not because, well, I'm on the worship team, so now i got to do it. <laughs> I mean, hopefully it doesn't take that motivation. But sometimes we need external forces to motivate us. Well, guess what? Maturity is when I don't need an external force anymore because internally the word has power and I'm motivated by faith. I'm motivated by God. I'm motivated by his love. I'm motivated by what he's done for me. So now I don't need someone to be like, did you read your Bible today? Maybe when I was younger in Christ and st still learning those disciplines, I needed someone to check on me. Hey, Don, did you, did you read your Bible? Yeah, yeah, I did. Well, I missed a couple of days, right? Sometimes we need external motivating factors. But there is an expectation that as we mature in our faith, as we grow in our faith, I don't need external motiva motivation anymore because my faith motivates me. So I want to spend time in the word. I want to pray. I want to make sure that I'm doing the things that God has told me to do. So let's keep reading. This is another one of those verses I love. Look at this. He says, so work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. <laughs> I like this. He's all work hard, but God's working in you. We have a responsibility to act on our faith. We have a responsibility to work hard. But it's not us who are actually working. 
It's the power of God working in us. And this verse makes me so happy because I don't know about you, but changing myself, I'm not really good at it. You know, trying to stay consistent in a healthy lifestyle, eh, depends on the week. None of us are really that great when it comes to self-control and long-term discipline. And so when I read this, because working hard for Jesus is hard work. I don't know if you guys realize that. It's, it's hard work. Living for Jesus is hard work. It is way easier just to do it my own way. Because I like my own way. <laughs> you know, you do too. You like your own way. Let's be real. But genuinely living for Christ takes hard work. But it's not me just trying to do it on my own. Be a good Christian. Be a good Christian. Make sure I'm nice. Make sure I forgive. I got to do this and I can't do that. Because if all you think about is what you can do and can't do, you're not going to make it. You can't just work hard for the sake of trying to prove to yourself. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that's true, but um, <clears throat> you need Christ to strengthen you. And sometimes, if we're honest, we fall into our own effort. I got to read the Bible more. I got to read the Bible more. I gotta read. Yes, you do. But what if instead of just trying to do it in my own strength, I said, Holy Spirit, will you work in me the desire for your word? Will you work in me and give me the desire to read your word? I know it's important, and truthfully, I can't seem to find time to do it which means it's not that important to me. Hello, can I be honest with you? If you're not spending time in the word, it's not because you're too busy. It's because it's not important enough. Whatever is most important to you, you will do. You will. If you're hungry, you'll find a way to eat. And some of you are hungry right now. It's taking a lot of self-discipline not to think about dinner. <laughs> But the truth is, we always do what's important to us. So here's what I've learned. When God is dealing with me about something I need to do to respond to what he's telling me, <laughs> if I don't want to do it, I tell him, God, I don't want to do it. Truthfully, I don't feel like it. And I don't think it's fair if you want to know the truth right now. But not my will. Your will be done. Holy Spirit, you said that you will work in me the desire and the power to do your will. So I am surrendering myself to you. That doesn't mean I wait till I feel like it. If you wait till you feel like responding in obedience, most likely you'll never do it. So don't wait till you feel like it. Well, Holy Spirit said he's working in me the desire. I don't got no desire. Because you got to partner with the Holy Spirit. you got to act out on it. Peter said, if it's really you, tell me to come and I will walk on water. Jesus said, it's me, come. Peter still had to decide. Oh my gosh, what did I say? Me and my big mouth. Out of my eye. I mean, should I? <laughs> like use your imagination. Peter opened his big, we know Peter had a big mouth. Have you read about Peter? The dude had a big mouth. He had a tendency to say things, I think, without thinking about him. I don't know if any of y'all can relate to Peter. But when Peter said it, and Jesus is like, come, he's like, I could just imagine, he's like, oh, shoot, now what? Sometimes I think we think Peter is like, yeah, buddy, oh, and he jumps out, you know. I don't think so. He's human like you and me. What if you were like, yeah, okay, Jesus, is that you? It's me, come. That was not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> you know, I mean, just use your imagination. Peter walked on water. He was the only disciple who walked on water. Why? Because he actually took a step of faith and he got out of the boat and he walked on water. Sometimes we don't experience the promises of God in our life because we're afraid to get out of the boat. We don't respond to his word in faith, which requires obedience. Abraham, the example James gave, could you imagine? We've talked about it, but... God tells Abraham, you finally have your promised son. Now take him up the mountain and kill him for me. Say what? God, you know what we went through to get this? I mean, I got Ishmael, I got Hagar, I got home issues as a result of this promised child. It's like 25 years and then we finally get the son and now he's 13 and you want me to what? You remember your promise, God? This son. And you want me to what? But James said, his faith 
made him right with God. But it was shown by the fact that he took Isaac and he put him on the altar and he lifted the knife. And that man was going to sacrifice his son in obedience. Why? Because he believed God. Another scripture tells us that he believed that God could raise him from the dead. So even though he didn't understand, Lord, I know that you can raise people from the dead. So if you tell me to do this, I'm going to do it. And then what happens in that moment? What happens? God stops him. The angel prevents him from killing his son. And then he said, look, and in the thicket was a ram. And then what does Abraham say? Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Abraham experienced an aspect of God that he had not yet really fully known. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. It wasn't until he took God at his word, he acted in faith, he raised the knife, he was going to go through with it. And then in that moment, he saw God as Jehovah Jireh. Sometimes you're not experiencing the blessings and the promises of God in your finances because you've not yet fully obeyed him to tithe. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I live by faith. I can tell you it works. Tithing works. It's faith and tithing is the action part. And I'm not saying that because the church needs your money. I'm saying that so that you can experience the blessing of God. So that you can know God as Jehovah Jireh. So here's what Philippians is saying. It's saying what? Work hard to show your salvation. Work hard. Prove it. Show it. How? By obeying God. So how do you work hard at salvation? Obey God. Why? Out of deep reverence. Fear of God. Ah, worship. He's holy. He's God. I'm not. I better do what he says. And then what's the promise? That God is working in you to give you the desire. What does it say? And the power to obey. That's the promise. If we will work hard by obeying God in deep worship and reverence and fear of God, he will work in us the desire to do his will. So back to reading the Bible. If you don't feel like it and you're not doing it, Ask Holy Spirit, give me desire. Work in me the desire to read your word. Work in me the desire to walk out forgiveness. Work in me the desire to be a person of integrity, to let my yes be yes and my no be no. But don't just wait until you feel it. Start doing it in obedience. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul says, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. <laughs> I don't know if this verse, does, it cracks me up. Paul's like, yo, I worked harder than all y'all. But not me. It was God working in me. You got to understand when we talk about faith and works, when I do good works, when I obey God to do the things he's called me to do, it's not really me because it's all grace. Paul says it's all grace. It's special favor. I don't deserve it. But God's poured out his favor on me. He's given me grace. And so I work hard, but I realize I'm not really the one who's working hard. It's God who's working hard in me. So I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters whom I dearly love, we need to work hard for the kingdom of God. You don't have to be full-time ministry to work hard for the kingdom of God. You work hard for the kingdom of God in responding to what God tells you in obedience. That's what we read in Philippians chapter 2. This kind of attitude that Paul has, it actually deflates pride and it promotes humility. Look, think about Paul. He achieved a lot. He wrote this at the end of his life when he's in prison in Rome. He says, I've done so much. I've worked so hard, but it really wasn't me. It was God working in me. That kind of humility will protect your faith. That acknowledgement that whatever I do for God isn't because I'm so good at being a Christian. It's not because I'm such a good person. The Bible says there is no one who is good. No, not one. Pastor Jaron does everything he does, not because he's so awesome, but because God works through him. And that man accomplishes a lot. If you ever been around him, he works hard. So we got to have active faith, 
Active faith requires hard work. Active faith requires obedience. It's motivated by God's grace. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It leads to a deeper experiential knowledge of the character of God. It causes us to grow, to mature, to increase, to faithfulness and abundance. It results in sanctification where we become like Jesus more and more and it's expressed through our outward actions. But there's also a passive faith. And I want to just make sure we're all aware of passive faith so that we don't deceive ourselves thinking, oh, I'm good because I believe. Let's look at passive faith. Look what Jesus said in the parable of the seed. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, when he was explaining the parable of the seed, right? The seed thrown on the rocky soil, the seed thrown in the, the weeds, the seed thrown on good soil. When the disciples came to Jesus, they said, hey, Jesus, we don't get this story. What does it mean? Here's one of the things Jesus said in chapter 13, verse 12. To those who listen to my teaching. Now, again, this isn't just in one ear and out the other. When he says those who listen, it means they take it in and they respond to it. So when the Bible says listen, it means like a parent, pay attention. You know when you tell your kid, listen to me. And they're like this. Look me in the eyes. <laughs> you know how you got to get your kid's attention? They're, yeah, mom, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean you better listen to me right now. What did I say? You know, you want them to repeat back to you. And how do you know they listen? Because they did what you told them to. It's the same thing with God, everybody. He says, listen to what I say. And does he, you know how he knows if you really listen? Because did you go and do what he told you to? Did you go clean your room? I heard you, mom. You didn't hear me because you didn't clean it. It's still dirty. I'm trying to put this in practical examples so that you get it. Because we over-spiritualize some stuff. So as a parent, we would say, my mom would say, I know you heard me when you did what I told you to. That's what, the, that's what James is saying. We know that you really heard when you did listen and obey. So Jesus said, if you listen to my teaching, read it. More understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening in one ear, out the other, you don't really do it. What does it say? Even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That's sober truth, y'all. Jesus said, if you listen and respond, you'll have more. But if you don't listen, even the little you have will be taken from you. So we read in James about seeing yourself in a mirror and walking away. When the Bible and you read it and God starts to deal with you about something, you got to obey. Because if you don't, even the little bit of knowledge you have, the little bit of faith you have, the little bit can be taken away from you. You'll just stay the same and you won't grow. Let's look at what Jesus said in the parable of the talents. Do you guys remember this one? To one servant he gave five talents. To the other servant he gave two talents. And to one servant he gave one. What did the guy with five talents do? He worked hard and he made ten he doubled the investment and the master's like, "Woohoo! good job. Well, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I'm going to give you more. The guy with two comes up. He takes two and he turns it into four hard work. The master's like, good job. Now come and share in my happiness. I'm going to give you more. Then the guy comes with one. He said, what did you do with my one? Well, I didn't do nothing. I went and I hid it because I know how you are. I didn't do nothing, so here's your one back. Ooh, the master was ticked off. He called him lazy. Good for nothing. He said, you should have at least put it in the bank and got me some interest. Look at what he says, verse 28 through 30. And he ordered, take the money from this servant. Give it to the one with ten. To those who use well what they are given even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant whew, into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Both these verses 
in these parables, 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 contrast people who listen and obey and those who do not. If you listen and obey, the promise is what? Increase, abundance, more. How many of y'all want more? I think the only time we don't want more is pounds. And I'm not talking about the British pounds. I'm talking about other than that, we want more. Our whole culture is about more, right? But there's a sober warning. And this is talking about Christians. If you don't act on and work hard at what God's given to you, the deposit of faith that you have, the treasures, the talents, the gifts that you have, if you don't do anything with it, you're going to lose it all. Not only that, where do they end up going? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not heaven, y'all, just in case you're wondering. That's hell. Spiritual death. You can't have all faith and no works. Well, I believe in God. I attend church. But if you don't respond to that, it's not enough. And it will lead to spiritual stagnation and death. So we can't just live in faith. And we can't just do works without faith. Do you guys get it now? Do you understand? Because if not, I'm going to preach another five hours. Do you see how important both are? They're not, they're not contradictory truths. A lot of people say, I can't believe the Bible. There's so much contradiction. Yeah, because you're looking at the surface. Go deeper. You find out they're complementary and they keep us in balance and they promote growth and maturity and fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. It promotes life. So do something with what God has given you. Look at your neighbor and say, do something already. Do something already. <laughs> do something. Act on it. Show just how seriously these verses show us how seriously God takes that we act on faith with good works. We must be good stewards of what God has given us. Let me, let me just list some of the things God's given us. First of all, faith. You only believe because Holy Spirit helped you believe. So God's given you the gift of faith. He's given us grace, mercy, forgiveness, salvation, protection, provision. What else? Faithfulness. He's, he's never left us or abandoned us. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't accuse us. He doesn't stay angry at us. He draws us close. He gives us his unconditional love. Hey, how much has God given you? He's given you joy, joy in the midst of difficult seasons. He turns your ashes into beauty. He takes away your sorrow and gives you joy. He removes a garment of despair and puts on a garment of praise. He's a God who gives and gives and gives and gives. There is so much you and I have. And we're not supposed to just keep it all to ourselves. Oh, I'm so glad God loves me. If you keep it to yourself, you become like the Dead Sea. You're stagnant and dead. That's why they call it the Dead Sea, by the way. Because everything goes in, nothing goes out. You know what works is? Taking everything that God's given me and then releasing it to the people in my life. Does that make sense? God's given us so much. He's given you time. He's given you talents. He's given you resources. What are you doing with it? How are you using what God has given you as a good steward, not to just try to earn something, to impress people. You can't impress God. He already knows anyways. He knows how ugly you are. You don't even know how ugly you are inside yet. <laughs> Hello, is that right? I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I have where God shows me something about myself and I was like, ew, I didn't even know it was there. And God's like, yeah, I was waiting until you could handle it. <laughs> But can I tell you some good news? That if God shows you something about yourself that you don't like and you didn't know what was there, because he knows you're ready with the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome it and to change. He doesn't show us bad things about ourselves so that we can walk around. Oh, man, here we go again. I suck. Can't do this Christian thing anymore. That's what the enemy wants us to do. Woe is me. I'm not a good Christian like them. So I'm not going to church. Right? 
that's what the enemy wants us to do. But anytime God reveals something that he wants to work on, not because he wants to shame us, he wants to demean us, he wants to punish us. No, he wants to set us free. And he knows now she's ready. Because he already knows what's inside of you and I. And he knows exactly how to help us overcome it, to live in greater freedom. I don't know about you, but God gives freedom. For whom the Lord sets free is what? Free indeed. We must walk out the things that God has given to us. Let me invite the worship team to come up. I would encourage you this week to read the book of James. It's only five chapters, okay? It's not that long, but it's power packed. Some of the other things that it talks about, besides the ones I've already mentioned, it talks about how we need to watch our mouth. (laughs) It talks about jealousy. It talks about fighting, selfishness, lying, boasting. It talks about temptation and motives, pride. It talks about how we should not criticize each other, judge one another. It warns us about self-reliance, disobedience, being ruled by wealth and money. Impatience, grumbling, swearing, hardship, sickness, suffering. Man, I'm telling you, I'm not sure there's not one thing that James doesn't hit on. So this is your challenge this week. I want you to read the book of James. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to encourage your heart. And whatever he shows you, please don't try to do everything in the book of James. You'll just be overwhelmed. (laughs) The one thing the Holy Spirit shows you in faith respond in obedience this week because it doesn't just talk about the bad it talks a lot about good and here's our last verse james chapter well our last two verses we'll put it up james chapter 2 verse 24 so you see we are shown to be right with god read it by what we do not by faith alone so you see that's how we show you know what god said when abraham was it like in the process of doing it? You know what he told Abraham? God said, now I know that you would withhold nothing from me. And I remember thinking to myself, now you know you're God. Didn't you know already? Like you knew what, until I had a friend explain it to me like this. When God said, now I know, he wasn't talking about head knowledge because God knows everything. He was talking about now I've experienced your faith. Now I've experienced your love for me. Now I know you love me the most. Wow. I don't know about you, but I want God to say, well, Don, now I know. Now I know you love me. Now I know. That's what our good works do. They just show God, hey, I do love you. I am grateful for your mercy. I am grateful for your grace. I am grateful that you never give up on me. I'm so grateful that when I'm faithless, you remain faithful, that you're always with me. I'm grateful that I have comfort. I'm grateful that you give me strength. I'm grateful that your grace is always empowering me. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for a word of encouragement. James 3.13, if you are wise and understand God's ways, Prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Prove it by doing good works. Faith and works leads to growth, maturity, abundance, increase. Let's stand. Father, we thank you. We don't deserve your unconditional love. We don't deserve your kindness, your mercy, your grace. Thank you that even though you are just, because of that, you gave your son Jesus to pay the punishment so that in mercy we are saved, not condemned. Thank you for grace. Thank you so much for joining us in this Midweek Fellowship. Visit our website for more information on knowing Jesus, as well as who we are as a church.
We hope to see you at one of our services this coming Sunday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He turn His face toward you and give you peace.